A real pleasure to be joined by Paul Jones. He's a senior biologist with the Alberta Conservation Association, and he's heading up the uh, pronghorn program, which looks at migration paths and and the collaring program to get get more information about their movements. Uh, first of all, Paul, thanks so much for taking some time and chatting with us today. Well, you're welcome, Mike. I'm looking forward to it. So let's talk a little bit. Let's talk a little bit about the animal itself. Now, pronghorn, uh, for some in Alberta or anywhere else, they also refer to them as antelope, but uh, that's not necessarily correct, is it? No, they're, the actual name is pronghorn. Where antelope comes from is the time of Lewis and Clark when they were, you know, coming out west and running into different animals that they'd never seen before. So when they seen the pronghorn, it reminded them of the African um, antelope. And that's why they called the name antelope came from. And it's kind of stuck ever since. But for us pronghorn biologists, we're, yeah, we're trying to kind of move the needle and get them referred to as pronghorn. I guess uh, when uh, one of the one of the characteristics about this animal and their ability to run, uh, they're they're pretty swift critters. They are, yeah. So they're actually the fastest land mammal in North America and the second fastest land mammal in the world, only to the cheetah of Africa. Um, so they can reach speeds anywhere up to 95 kilometers to 100 kilometers an hour. Um, and if you look at their anatomy, they are actually built for running. So they actually have an enlarged heart, an enlarged lung system. Uh, for generating speed. And then if you look at their leg bones, their leg bones are about the size of your index finger. And it's just basically built for running as fast as they can. I guess that's a great segue into their migration patterns. And, and traditionally, where have uh, pronghorn moved during the winter months? Well, that's a good, good question. Like historically, going way back when we have no idea because we just didn't have the technology to identify those those migration pathways but now with the advancements in technology and gps satellite callers we're starting to get an idea of where these migrations are happening so we do know in alberta um, that they do have a sort of a north south migration pattern so we have animals that have crossed the, been able to cross the trans canada highway in the fall and head south down to that mindy berries area um, that was historically back in 2003. And then we do know sort of springtime migrations that like animals that are on that CFP Suffield area, which is a major wintering area, they'll move north, east and northwest. So we have interconnected populations. A lot of our animals will move to the northeast and leave Alberta and actually head into Saskatchewan. And then we also have animals that will move from that Suffield area up into the Brooks area. And then depending on what kind of winter we're having, we're also starting to identify what we call facultative migrations, which are basically movements in response to the environmental conditions, which typically is snow. And then here we'll see our animals actually leave Alberta and head down into Montana. We're also seeing animals that we have collared now in Saskatchewan, kind of moving, if they're on the south side of the Trans-Canada Highway, down south into Montana and wintering down in Montana and then coming back the following spring. Or if animals are on the north side of the Trans-Canada Highway, we're starting to see patterns of animals moving more in a westerly direction and leaving Saskatchewan and coming into Alberta, into that wallace Irvin area and trying to winter in that, that area. So I guess maybe another little step backwards, and, and, and that is to understand why it's important that the Alberta Conservation Association took this mission on in the first place. Why do we want to know where pronghorn are going and, and the development of the collaring program? Um, why, you know, what, what do we lose, I guess, at the end of the day, if this critter, um, you know, ceases to exist on the, on the prairies? Yeah, that's a very good, very good question. So when we did our original study back in 2003 to 2007 in Alberta, we identified migration pathways. And you look at that landscape and it's changing, especially around the city of Medicine Hat and along the Trans-Canada Highway. And it's becoming more and more fragmented. And now we have sort of new players on the landscape in terms of renewable energy, which we really don't know how they impact pronghorn and how pronghorn react to them. So now we're getting a more fragmented landscape. And then the question beca becomes, well, are pronghorn able to move in this landscape? 
And then the bigger question is, is what happens if they don't? And if they don't, and we trap them in areas and we get severe winters and we start seeing mass die-offs, we, we see reductions in populations, which then has, you know, potentially an economic impact for Alberta if we lose the ability for recreational hunting on the species. And then if we lose them completely in Alberta and Saskatchewan, then we've lost um, an endemic species, ungulate, to North America. They're not found anywhere else in North America. They actually originally developed evolutionary in North America. So like some of our other ungulates like elk and deer that sort of crossed the land bridge and came from Europe over into North America, pronghorn didn't do that. They actually evolved on the plains of North America. So if if we can... And, and I'm totally guessing here, Paul, I don't know um, what the data has shown you so far, but if you know where the mar- migration patterns are located, and I guess one of the big barriers that have, has to be addressed, that's the uh, the establishment of, of barbed wire, segregating land, uh, part of that, that, uh, that issue that you talked about earlier in the changing landscape, But if we know where the migration paths are, could it not just be a simple matter of coordinating with landowners to say, hey, make adjustments to your your barbed wire wire fence and let's allow those animals to pass through. But I I have a feeling that that's a a huge oversimplification on my behalf. Yeah, yeah, it's not not that easy. So fences are unique to pronghorn because pronghorn, basically 99% of the time will crawl underneath the bottom wire if it's high enough and they can get under it. So now we have fences across this entire landscape across North America um, that some fences are designed well. Um, They've got eight, like a, a minimum of 18 inches above the ground for that bottom wire, which allows easier passage by pronghorn. But if they're not, then those fences can become barriers. And then if we have snow build up in the wintertime along fences, one fence that was once permeable maybe become impermeable. I mean, I, I, I think of uh, the work that TJ Schwanke has done uh, on behalf of the uh, Alberta Wildlife Federation and, and you folks uh, in, in getting or, uh, organized with volunteers and going out every summer. I forget how many years he's been doing it, but it, it's, it, it's quite remarkable. But again, maybe when you look at it, is it just a drop in the bucket when you really look at just how many thousands of kilometers of barbed wire there are yeah yeah exactly i mean but but it's the the value of that is working with certain landowners and getting them by and and then having them talk to their neighbors about well this is what i did it and this is why i did it so eventually we're hoping like a movement will happen so that ranchers kind of understand how potentially impactful their their fences are so when they're doing regular maintenance Hopefully they'll start to adopt and yeah, I can raise it up to 18 inches. I'm replacing the wire anyways, because it needs fixing. And then, you know, that's where we'll start getting, you know, a bigger buy-in and, you know, making a bigger enhancement for pronghorn and their movement. Paul, uh, do you have a sense of the population of pronghorn in Alberta? Um, No, that's sort of taken care of by the government. But if I had to estimate, I think we've had sort of a series of mild winters um or more common winter so i bet you we're around that somewhere between 15 and 18,000 in the province and um, out of that how many animals have you collared um and had has there been any surprises um that that have popped up um through the collaring program and and as you track those animals yeah so we've just initiated a new study uh last december so december 20 24, where we actually collared um, 106 individual female pronghorn split between Alberta and Saskatchewan. And we did it in both provinces because we know the population's interconnected. And then this past December, just two weeks ago, we've collared an additional 156 pronghorn between both jurisdictions. Yeah, and we are seeing some unique patterns. Again, animals in Saskatchewan that are on the north side of the Trans-Canada Highway, they very rarely cross the Trans-Canada, but did more of a west sort of facultative movement because on the north side, it was sort of more of a severe, I would consider severe winter conditions there. So they kind of tried to come into Alberta. Uh, We have, we had at least um, half a dozen to 20 animals that between Alberta and Saskatchewan that spent at least part of their uh, winter down in Montana last year. 
And we actually had three individuals that spent time in all three jurisdictions. So they spent some time in Alberta, in Saskatchewan, and in Montana. So it really speaks to the interconnected of this, this population. It's not just an Alberta pronghorn or a Saskatchewan pronghorn. It's a northern sagebrush pronghorn that you know can spend time between all three jurisdictions. And then we're starting to see some unique behaviors in terms of social dynamics of our collared animals. And I have one particular group where we call our two animals, two separate places. They were about 20 kilometers apart that wintered separately. And in the spring, two of them found each other and they spent the whole summer together. And then come this fall, a third animal has showed up in the area. And the two that summer together have now split up. And one of them is now with this new animal that showed up in the area. So it's kind of showing how really fluid the social structure is for pronghorn. So when a landowner or a person sees a group of pronghorn, let's say five animals one day, and then sees, you know, five animals the next day in roughly the same area, it could potentially be a different five animal. Talk a little bit about the process. How do you go about uh, putting a collar on on these animals that um, can can take off in an, in an instant? Yeah, so there's been a real shift in how animals are captured in, in the bio biological world, where it used to be all like clover traps and, and, and drugging and darting animals. And now it's almost completely shifted to using helicopters. So everything is done via professional companies um, that net gun pronghorn out of out of a helicopter. So basically, they'll, they'll identify a herd they want to capture, and then the pilot will maneuver the herd um, so that the net gunner who's in the back of the helicopter is able to shoot the net out of the helicopter and then capture, usually it's one single individual in the net and then they land. And then for pronghorn, I like the helicopter crew to do all of the processing. So they put the collar on for us. They take the, the photos that we request, they take the blood samples and then they let the animals go. Because pronghorn are really susceptible to capture myopathy, they get high strung out. Um, so the less time you're actually handling the animal, I feel is better for the animal. So that's why we have the capture crews do it. And they're averaging basically once the animal's down on the ground within four to five minutes, they can get the collar around the blood samples and then get that animal back up on its feet and, and running again. And in terms of the, the length that the animal is wearing the collar, um, is it, is it a, a set duration and then the collar automatically falls off or over time it falls off? What, what's the process there? Yeah. So, I mean, it, it kind of varies based on battery life and based on your fix rate. Um, so I'm trying to maximize data from individ individuals. So I've set my fix rate. So they collect the location every five hours. And then unless they're in this sort of what we call this geofence. So I put like sort of pins in the collar around the Trans Canada Highway. And when an animal moves into that sort of geofence, it changes to a 15 minute relocation. So I get sort of really high resolution spatial and temporal data of how they're interacting with the Trans Canada Highway. But for most of my animals with that five hour fixed rate, we're looking at having them on three to four years on the same individual. And then there is a time drop off mechanism that will trigger at that four year mark and the collar will fall off. But I also do have the ability via the, the website where we're able to track the data to trigger the drop off manually. And then it will drop off basically within hours of me triggering it. What so, yeah. do, sorry, Paul, what, no. what does success look like for you in terms of this program? Uh, at the end of the day, um, you've got a whole bunch of data. Um, where do you go with it from there? Yeah. So, I mean, I think for us, success is being able to see what the actual migration movement patterns are from individuals and get an understanding of whether that's changing um, in the land because of the landscape. And if we're making more of an anthropogenic footprint on the landscape, are animals still able to move? And then uh, alternatively, we're also looking at the Trans Canada Highway and whether that's becoming a specific barrier to pronghorn movement. And if it is a case, we're working with the Mistakis Institute and the Canadian Wildlife Federation to create awareness about the potential barrier the Trans Canada is getting. And that maybe we should start thinking about, you know, having a overpass or underpass system built to allow for easier passage by pronghorn. Um, because I remember from the original study, one of our biggest movements and she's actually holds the record for North America. She did 445 kilometers in a three week period, moving from that many berries area all the way north into Saskatchewan near Malkin. But she spent three days on the south side of the Trans Canada Highway, basically moving 
parallel to the highway back and forth along the fence line before she had the courage to actually cross the highway and then continue her migration. So that was kind of one of the impetus that, you know, it might be becoming more of a barrier than we think. You know, we're seeing increased traffic with, you know, economic development in Canada. So, um, yeah, so we're looking at can we create awareness and eventually, hopefully, we would be able to see crossing structures. Um, and for prong corn, the preference would be an overpass, right? Because they have great eyesight. They can see a mile away movement and stuff. So they prefer to use an overpass because it's their main predator defense, right? Being able to see. So they don't like going in to an underpass or, or a tunnel because they can't see what's on the other side. Um, but there's starting to be some work done in Wyoming where they're looking at really wide span bridges that create a better view on either side of the highway that um, we're going to be, I'm interested to see how pronghorn react to those. How many, uh, how many more years uh, will this program uh, stay active within the Alberta Conservation Association? Yeah. So right now we've done two years of capture and we're scheduled to do a third year next December. So December, 2026. And then from there, it'll likely the last date will come in, you know, four years after that. So somewhere 2029, 2030, but when the last data points come in and then there'll be, you know, a year or two, you know, for all of the different analysis that we want to do. So it, it's a long-term commitment and um, that's had, you know, great funding support. Yeah, maybe we should talk a little bit about the partners that are 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 with you on this project. Uh, I know it's not something the ACA has done on its own. Yeah, so we've received funding from the Minister of Special License, both the raffle and the auction. So the raffle is, is administered by ACA, but all and then the auction is administered by APOS, the Alberta Professional Outfitter Society. Um, and then also they have a wildlife development fund, APOS does, which has supported this project. I've got funding from Parks Canada, um, Environment, ACCC, uh, Dallas Safari Club, and Blood Origins out of the um, BC. And then also out of a U.S. grant, National Fish and Wildlife Foundation has also supported this project. All right, Paul, we'll leave it there. Thanks so much for spending some time and fascinating program. And we wish, wish you nothing but continued success in gathering the, the movements of, of uh, pronghorn uh, across Alberta and beyond. Sounds good. Thanks for the interview. And I'll just make one last point is if people want to join up to ACA social media, we do map, uh, provide a map the last Thursday of every month that sort of depicts one of the animals movement patterns, just to give people an idea of how much these animals are actually moving.